From the Hype HQ studio in Chicago, Illinois, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast, season 12. Hello, everybody. My name is Raj Nation, and I am the founder of Startup Hype Man. I help startups stand apart from their competition and stand out to their audience with storytelling, messaging, and pitches that perform. In this podcast, you'll hear my conversations with startup leaders from around the globe as they share a slice of their company's story, stories on growth, scale, successes, and failures, all to help you and your company grow up and ultimately stand out. Before we begin today's episode, I'd like to invite you to join the email newsletter that doesn't suck. That's right. If you head to startuphypeman.com and enter your email address, first, you'll get my free SaaS masterclass, but you'll also get updates whenever you release new episodes, plus my storytelling tips and advice periodically throughout the month and helpful resources from Startup Hype Man partners. It's the newsletter that doesn't suck, available at startuphypeman.com. All right, speaking of things that don't suck, let's begin today's episode of Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, making her way to the microphone from London, England, and currently residing in Los Angeles, California, she is the founder of Pod.io. Please welcome Dr. Joe Weber. Joe Weber, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Have you had an introduction like that before in your life? Nope, that's a first. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to talk to you. This is Joe Weber of Pod.io on our show here on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Pod.io is the world's first social networking platform putting people on the map. Um, specifically, what they do is enable users to connect with others based on shared interests and location, utilizing proximity data and artificial intelligence. Um, so really like a, a better way to connect for many millennials and people who just you know, more or less feel like they need more connection in their life that they're not currently getting from either their contacts or uh, their existing social platforms. Pod is it launched earlier this year, February of 2019. They've already achieved 5 million uh, web users and they just launched their mobile app earlier this week in October. Uh, they're getting 10,000 new signups per month on the platform. 55 million connections have been made. They are doing a lot of things right and I'm super excited to dive into this today. We are specifically talking about with Joe, uh, the concept of building a team and really within that specifically doing whatever it takes to find the right team members. Now, Joe, can you just give our listeners a little bit of an abstract or a brief on why this topic is important to you of doing whatever it takes to find the right team? Well, I think, you know, you start with an idea and then you spend some time investigating. You might develop a method of getting your idea into action. If you have funding, now you have all of the basic ingredients necessary to start a business, except the people. And it's all about the people. And I think, you know, one thing that most entrepreneurs will tell you if they've got any experience with this is you're always looking for the talent and making sure you find people that can work as a team. So it's incredibly important to us to make sure we have a team that can work together. Now, we're going to talk all about that and kind of the, what I have learned, at least in our previous conversations, is a pretty cool story of how you've pulled together your team. But before we do that, let's learn a little bit more about you. Uh, something that I think is fascinating is that you have a PhD in quantum physics. I guess my only question to that is, what? <laughs> Tell me about what that was like, uh, why you chose that, and what do you feel it's given you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, growing up in the UK, I went to university, I did a degree in uh, chemistry. So I was always interested in the sciences. Um, and while I was doing that, I was asked to, instead of going out into the workplace, which I intended to, I was asked if I wanted to, to do a PhD. So I was invited to this PhD. And it, to be honest with you, it was actually the one subject that I found the hardest. So I figured like, you know, if I could challenge myself and maybe conquer this, uh, that would be a really kind of a really good thing to try and do. So it was a challenge for me. Um, I ended up enjoying it tremendously. I think, you know, Albert Einstein died thinking that his, that his famous calculations that he wanted to run 
were unachievable because he, he figured out it would take four man lifetimes to run one of these calculations. He didn't foresee the advent of the computer. And I was able to run these calculations in about, they took about four days to run on a VAX. This is back in the 1980s. Um, and then I got access to a Cray in London. I could run them in about, about four hours. They were running on the Cray, <clears throat> excuse me, these very complex calculations. You know, nowadays, the way things have moved on, you could probably run them on your laptop. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's quite, it's quite wild to think what he, what I said predicted would take four lifetimes. He got down to four days and then four hours. And then now, who knows, maybe it's even just a mobile app on a phone that can run it these calculations, be, you're right? right? You're, you're right. <laughs> Moore's law proving, proving true yet again. So yeah. that's fascinating. And, and to me, what's interesting about what you just said there is it was the subject you found the hardest, the most challenging, and that's why you chose it. Most people will pick the thing they have a natural inclination for and are already pretty good at. You chose the exact opposite. To me, that speaks a lot to sort of your character around grit and determination, which is obviously a valuable characteristic to have as an entrepreneur. But do you look at that experience getting your PhD in quantum physics as, as a lesson in grit and kind of taking on something no matter what? Yeah, I think definitely a lesson in taking on something that you're not comfortable with, right? You know, I just got a, I got a degree and I did well on my degree. I'd, I'd been out in industry for a year and I'd, I'd succeeded there and the firm I was with invited me to go and work for them. So I had a job offer. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a step outside to do this PhD. Um, I think for me, if it had just been something that I could have done easily, I would have actually taken the job. It, it was the chat. It was the challenge that intrigued me. Um, and also the whole, I don't know, I don't have time to get into this now, but the whole idea behind uh, quantum physics, quantum mechanics and the laws in there and how, things behave at a subatomic level and how it's completely counterintuitive to everything we see in our daily lives. It's, it's, it's actually incredibly fascinating. Mm. Mm. So you see a lot of parallels to human behavior in that. <laughs> well, it's, it's totally different, right? I mean, it's the, the, the way things behave at a subatomic level is so different than how they behave at, you know, at the level that we see, the macro level we see every day. Mm. And, um, you know, so you, that's where you get, you hear these things about, I know Schrodinger's cat is always the favorite analogy is there's a cat in the box with a vial of, of uh, poison at any time is the cat dead or alive, right? The only way you know is by taking the lid off the box. So that's the real world, um, that we're used to every day in the quantum mechanical world. We would look at that and say that the cat is in a state of both being dead and alive. Huh. At the same <laughs> Okay, I see what you could, I see what you mean by this could be a whole nother conversation. On its yeah, own. I, I so maybe maybe another time you and I will just get together and you will explain to me the philosophy behind that because I find that stuff really interesting. But um I want to talk a little bit more about your history. So I would say, you know, you, you've got a very impressive background, but I, I would say maybe one of your bigger claim to fames would be um founding uh and launching uh, Virtual Piggy, which in the early 2010s, Forbes coined as PayPal for kids. Can you let our listeners know about Virtual Piggy? Uh, what did it grow to and, and what was the outcome of that? Sure. I think, you know, with Virtual Piggy, um, we ended up with a, we had a product that I thought was, was really solid. Um, the original idea came from, we were building um, essentially an environment, a gaming environment where you could build a game and in that game, like let's say I took three photos of you from three different angles, I could turn that into an avatar and you could play yourself in a game. And what we were trying to do was looking at blending what we saw coming through with reality TV and that whole uh, genre of things becoming more realistic and more personalized into a gaming world. So you could create games and, and allow people to play themselves in them. Um, and we had one small piece of that whole platform was the ability to, if you were under 18, to be able to pay for items in the game. Because we could see, and there still is a big problem, kids desperate to play things on games. We're still living in a cash society if you're under 18, largely. They don't have credit cards. They don't have debit cards. And 
they end up doing things like stealing their parents or grandparents' PayPal's accounts. They borrow credit right. cards. Um, often it's only like a $2 purchase or something. They just have no way of doing it. So you, we could see this friction. Um, so that was our platform. And we went out to raise money on that. And almost to a man, everybody said, I'm not investing in another gaming platform, but I really like that virtual piggy idea. <laughs> if you could just separate that, I'd invest in that. And that's what we did. Um, so we, we separated the virtual piggy idea and just went after that. Um, Forbes looked at it and said, as you're right, they said, oh, it's PayPal for kids. Because the basic idea was you could uh, be on a site. Um, at, at one point, I think 2015, I think Facebook adopted it. So if you were playing Facebook games and you were under 18, you had a method of paying. Now, just to give you an idea, we, we created seven patents on it. The basic premise was that as a parent, you could, you'd have a master account which would control the sub account which your child or children would use. And, and then they're um, basically like withdrawing from like whatever fund was put in by the parents? That's right. So, you know, the parent always has complete visibility and control. Um, it, we later on, we partnered with uh, Discover and came up with a Oink back Discover card. Um, again, it was a, it was a prepaid card. So, um, you know, the, 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 you could only spend what was on it. It wasn't a credit card. Sure. Um, I think it, it, it was great in terms of teaching uh, young people to manage their money instead of just being given cash where there's no kind of, you know, nobody's really, there's no discipline to it. Yeah. You got. There's, that's it. That's it. Raj. No discipline. So I think it was strong for that. We, we found, um, we found a great use for it in, uh, you know, parents often when there was two parents, they were very busy or if the parents were divorced, being able to really track the money that they were giving to their kids and manage that effectively. Um, you could be, your kid could be away somewhere and need something and you could like get onto your app and just put in 20 bucks into the kid's account and it was immediately available on the card yeah so you know just that safety of mind you give your kids a card it's not loaded with much if it gets lost or stolen it's not a big deal Mm -hmm. but if you need to you can immediately drop funds in for them yeah kind of like as you need it allowance from the parent to the kid yeah and yeah, and I could see how totally how that builds some like financial discipline then in them as they see, hey, money is not an endless thing that grows on trees. Right. right. <laughs> so what ended up being, um, so that's kind of what it grew to. Uh, ultimately, what was the outcome of Virtual Piggy? And well, it's still, out, it's still out there. They've, um, since I left, they've you know, changed some things. They've gone a couple of different directions, but it's a publicly traded company. That's pretty uh, cool. That's, <laughs> Still available, yeah. I think in many ways, uh, Rog, we were ahead of our time. Um, I I think it was maybe five years too early. It, FinTech was only starting to take yeah. off. And we were tackling um, the two things you care about the most, you know, your children and your money. We, we were putting them together into one. And it was, I think, a little bit, it was a bit hard to get it to really take off in a huge way. Yeah. Um, but I think now is the time for this platform. I think uh, people are going to start to embrace this now. Did you exit before the IPO? You, did you exit the company before the IPO? The, it was a little unusual. The company was set up as a public company from the beginning. So oh. we were a, ver, a very small public company. Not a good place to be, by the way. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that again. I guess life is all about different experiences. Um, I think we'd have fared much better as a, as a private company. Mm. Um, but we were like from the get go. So we had to deal with that from, from, from the start. Okay. Okay. Let's move into talking about pod now. So I gave the, the background at the beginning, but I'd love to hear you elaborate on top of that. Can you let our listeners know, um, just in your own words, what is pod? Absolutely. So I think, you know, the thing we feel is, and our thesis is that people actually do want to meet each other. Um, the idea with Pod, or the idea behind Pod, is it's a platform, an app, where we encourage people to find each other and meet, physically meet each other based on common interests or things that you might be interested in. And I think, you know, just to give you a background, if you look at the first round of uh, social media apps, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these apps encourage us to take our friends and put them online and then communicate with them online. And 
pod in many ways is the antithesis of this. What pod does is it encourages you to meet new people every day. So um, at any time you open up the pod app and there are people out there that want to meet for various reasons. It may be a professional reason. They might be uh, a real estate agent. They might be a, an attorney. They might be a graphic designer looking for gigs. You know, we've got a, a third of the U.S. workforce are now in the gig economy. So how do you, how do you meet people? How do you make those connections? Um, so we think there's a wealth of social capital out there. People who have a skill, other people who need a skill, people who have shared interests. You know, maybe I want to go kite surfing this weekend and I need some people to go with. Being able to connect and find, find those people. Maybe I'm a yoga instructor and I want to try and find new clients. So I'm going to hold a free yoga session on the beach. Pod gives all those people a forum to show, to showcase um, what they do, to put out there. You can create these, um, these groups and meetings called pods. So a pod might be a free yoga group on the beach at 10 o'clock, or it might be a lawyer holding a session on uh, GDPR or something very dry like that. <laughs> or, <laughs> or it could be an alumni, you know, a university alumni, being able to track each other. You know, I'm at an airport, I've got 20 minutes to spend. I wonder if there's anyone from my, my alumni or my sorority, mm. you know, in, in, the, in the airport, you can go and watch the game on the TV together. Sure. And the key really is that it's, it's location-based, right? It's, it's only location. about who's around you. Yeah. I'd say location and we're using machine learning. Um, you know, as you know, AI is a branch of machine learning. Um, so right now we're leveraging machine learning and we're about to start leveraging AI to help foster better connections between people. Mm. Now, you launched this in February of 2019. As of this recording, it's October 2019. The stats I read out at the beginning included 5 million users, which is so impressive. Uh, can you give our listeners sort of the backstory on how you got, how you got 5 million users? Sure, sure. So we, you know, we, we had this idea. We wanted to create this framework. Um, and I was looking at companies at the time. This is 2018. I was looking at a number of different companies. Um, with the idea that we would acquire a business that had a network that looked that that was looked like it was a, a professional network of people um, that we felt would benefit from this app. So as we went out there, we came across this one company, um, a company called Refer.com, and they had built up a user base, and they had also acquired a company called Referral Key. And Referral Key had 5 million members. And when I looked at this member base, um, I could see these are professionals and they are looking, they're not finding their connection needs in other social media apps. So they're turning to Referral Key and it's helping them make these member to member connections. Um, as we looked at it, uh, we got to know the, the, um, one of the founders behind that company. And we merged the companies um, earlier this year and what we are doing is we are uh, upgrading essentially the um, referral key users, the 5 million users. We're giving them all pod accounts. So for them, pod is like the mobile version of referral key. Um, we could tell from this user base that over 50% of them were accessing referral key on a mobile device, on some kind of phone. Um, so we know, you know, we felt sure that there's a need for this kind of um, mobile friendly version and as well as including the features that they have in referral key the ones that have proven to be robust and, and used because we can see what's being used we included that feature set but also opened it up and made the map really the, the star of the show so when you open pod the first thing you see is the map and you can see who's around you now we've already realized we could do another episode on quantum physics I'm realizing now we could probably do another episode on getting people to, to buying a customer base and then getting them to convert to what you're doing. But what we are, what we have decided this episode will be around is actually on building the team. So um, you've got yourself and I would call it your founding team or at least your C-level team at this point. Um, can you just let us know what are the, what are the roles that exist at the company right now and how big is the team at this point? 
Sure. So there's like less than 10 of us right now. Um, we are, we have outsourced as well as uh, in-house uh, people. Um, we have an international team. Um, and uh, I, I think I'm going to share that story with you in a little, in a minute, but uh, uh, yeah, we have, we have people located throughout the world. In some ways that's not ideal. I love to have people close by but based on the very specific uh, talent areas that I was looking for, um, it meant that we needed to go further afield than just, just Los Angeles where we're based. Yeah. And so let's, let's get into that a little bit more, right? Our, our primary topic here is doing whatever it takes to build your team. And it's, it's funny that that was the title that we decided to let's make that the title of this episode, because oftentimes in my show introduction, I'll say like the purpose of this show is to help you figure out what whatever it takes mean for your co- means for your company. And so what we're going to talk about here is what did whatever it takes mean for you in terms of building your team. So let's, can you kind of walk us through when you had the idea for pod, what would, what did you realize was like the first one or two roles and what was your thought process in, in getting people on board? Sure. So, you know, the first thing I had was I was fortunate enough to have a, um, a funder, a co-funder. I, I funded the company partially myself, but I also had somebody else who's a very experienced businessman. And he was actually my first investor 15 years ago, my first company. Um, so we have stayed in touch and uh, he was interested in doing this. So he came in as a, co, a co-founder, co-funder with me at the beginning. But then I needed a team. Um, I got two really strong guys from the acquisition that we did. Um, then I hired a CTO. So I went out in LA area and, and interviewed a number of candidates and picked a CTO. I had, uh, Casey who I'd worked with for previous years, handling finance and HR. So she came in to take those pieces of the system. A very good friend of mine who we've worked together for the last 20 years, um, He recommended a UI UX designer. I was kind of burning through a few UI UI, UX designers early on. I'm very fussy about the look of the product. Um, I feel branding is super important and trying to deliver an easy user experience. So this friend recommended this uh, UI UX designer who turned out to be fantastic. So at that point we were off the ground, but we didn't have any developers. Now, one thing I wanted to do was I'd been reading about React Native and in Virtual Piggy, the previous company, we would develop first on iOS and then we'd create an Android version and they were never in sync. So one of the really attractive things to me about React Native, you know, when you look out there, you've got these two massive platforms, the Android and the iOS platform, massive. And you, you can't really pick one of them. The thing I love about the idea behind React Native is to be able to build once and deploy on both platforms simultaneously. Um, but it was proving really difficult to find developers with React Native experience in the LA area. So I started to look online. Um, I found a really solid young developer with React Native experience in the Ukraine. Um, so we got on a Skype with my CTO and we interviewed him and he was excellent. Well, and before, I mean, before we get into his yeah. excellence and how you then talk to him, his excellence is if he's like, you know, yeah. a, a royalty or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to just take a slight step back and ask you, how, you know, you said you started to look online, but you know, I mean, you did, did you just Google search react native developers? Like how, what, what was your search no. process even? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of platforms out there. Um, I think the, the main one I used was um, Upwork, uh, which is a conglomeration of a number of these platforms sure. where they, you have gig, basically gig workers. Right. Um, now, it's interesting it, because Upwork is typically known for more, I would say like low level, not low level, but like uh, more like kind of just like... F- generic freelance there's specialties within it but almost like sort of as you need things developed you go to upwork because you're like oh crap i can't find someone let me just see if there's someone who will do it for cheap right that's kind of the mentality of upwork of using upwork but you actually thought hey i might be able to find a core team member on upwork 
Right. I mean, there's definitely that, right? And we did burn through a few people in the early days that just weren't right and were, as you say, they were looking for just a quick gig. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was what was, and I think we actually ended up, this particular guy who ended up leading our team, um, we, we connected to him outside of Upwork. He, so we had some team members coming through Upwork, some coming through, I use LinkedIn. We did use Google. Um, there were a number of platforms that we used. And I, th- I think, you know, the up, we've had mixed experience with Upwork. To, to be fair, we've had some really good ones who've stayed with us for, you know, a few months. Um, I think we've got one guy right now who's been with us for about three months. Um, but, uh, and we also, we had some early designers come through Upwork and some of them we bounced out. Um, we had an early developer who helped us get prototyping done. So I think you're dead right there. Um, the, the, the team members who have stayed with us we're not through Upwork. We, we met them through other areas. We are with Dr. Joe Weber, the founder of Pod.io, talking about doing whatever it takes to build your team. So we get to the, you, you find this person in the Ukraine and what's the, what's the person's name? It's Dimitro. Okay. So you find Dimitro in the UK. How did this conversation go down? You know, talk us through that part of the story. So we get on Skype with him. And it's amazingly crystal clear Skype between Los Angeles and the Ukraine. I was, <laughs> I was, I was just surprised. It was like he was in my living room. Um, we interviewed him. I thought he was excellent. Not only was he technically very sharp, I could tell he, he could speak excellent English and I could tell he was very intelligent based on how the conversation was going. Um, he'd been very successful and he was actually he's a young guy he's starting his own business. So at first he was like, I'm just too busy. I'm just starting my own business. And then we told him about the idea and he loved it. And he said, I'm really busy, but this, I want to be part of this. And that's how he agreed to work with us. Um, He then brought in two additional resources onto the team. And that was our original team, Dimitro plus Artem and Max out of the Ukraine. Um, The team was assembled and ready to go, but we'd never worked before together and we were from all over the planet. So you've got this team that is global and it's still, I mean, it's still a concept, right? At this point, the the app hasn't been built, the, the, the desktop version hasn't been built. So you're, you're taking on a pretty tremendous task at this point, right? Most people are trying to just figure out how do they like, get in touch with the person down the street. Meanwhile, you're trying to coordinate four different time zones uh, across the world and hope that everyone's internet is working at that time, right? And, and everyone will be sharp and, and awake for the calls that you're going to have. So um, did, you, did you need to have face to like in-person stuff? Did you end up meeting each other live outside of Skype to like confirm, hey, this is the right thing that we're doing? Or were you able to just build full trust through, uh, virtually? Yeah, no, and not really, right? So um, we had another key member of the team. His name is Chris. Um, Chris was a founder of the original referral key product. So he became, he is our head of product in the company. And he is the visionary behind um, the pod app in terms of uh, a lot of the features and the function set that you see in it. So Chris and I have been working together to really, you know, as a major stakeholder, as a CEO, I'm a major stakeholder too. The two of us got together to really figure out the requirements, then working with Tuka, the CTO, to kind of understand what was going in the MVP. Um, but things really weren't working well. You know, we had the team in the Ukraine. We'd never met them. Uh, we had another guy from Spain. Uh, The team in the Ukraine eventually rejected him. They said he wasn't strong enough. So I I felt the team was, we were working, but we weren't working well enough. So I asked the three Ukrainian developers to come to California to meet us. This wasn't possible. They couldn't get in our country. They can't get in our country right now. (laughs) <laughs> and then you're right because right? they're they're in the ukraine right and there's yeah there's a I lot mean, right, going on so right now it's even worse yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they couldn't they couldn't get to us so i looked uh to getting into the ukraine myself 
and taking the CTO and the head of product with me to the Ukraine. And it looked like if we survived, <laughs> it was still a really tricky journey. You know, we're getting, you know, I'm looking up things online where people are saying, do not even attempt this journey, you know, from uh, Kiev to Sumy, which is where our guys are. So then I said to them, could you get to London? No, they can't get into London. France? Yeah, we can get to France. Okay, three-hour flight to France. Great. Let's meet in Paris. Wait, hang on. Hang on. July in Paris. That's going to be awful. It's going to be super expensive, steaming hot and full of tourists. Uh, what about Nice? Can you get to Nice? Yes, three-hour flight to Nice. So that was it. We settled in on Nice. Um, <laughs> And then a friend of, friend of mine, long-term colleague, the one who turned me on to the UIX designer, offered to come. He's in the UK, but he's always a good addition. So I said, please come along. And that is how three Ukrainians, one American, one Finn, one Irishman, and one English woman came to spend three days in France, all holed up in a hotel working together. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> Three I Ukrainian, know. right? <laughs> and I, I, want, I, want people, I want everyone listening to realize, if in case you missed it through what Joe just told us, in this process, one of the questions she had to ask herself was, are we going to survive? And, I, and not as a company, but as human beings who have a yes. pulse, she had to ask, <laughs> are we going to survive if we make this trip? Because they may have had to go to the Ukraine. So... That really is to me. That's that's a story in in kind of just figuring out a solution, right? More than anything else. Like, I think a lot of people would say, "Oh, well, you can't come to the U.S. We can't come to where you live. I guess we'll just keep doing things virtually." But you really looked at no. How do we make this happen? Because we're not we're not functioning at the capacity. Right. Or we're not building at the capacity that we should be, and it's not going to work if we keep doing this multi time zone Skype stuff. As you talked, what I mapped out was sort of like four key anchors to your story or your process. And I want you to, as I read these, I'd like you to maybe just like add additional thought or comment to them. So to me, where it starts is when you think about doing whatever it takes to build your team, it starts with don't restrict yourself to your location. I think a lot of people just say, hey, who's in the LA area in your case? Let me just find someone. And then you settle on geography being your restrictive element. Yep. Very true. Um, and, and that's what, so that's where I see your process started with. Is there anything else you think you can add to that thought or that sentiment? Um, you know, I do think it's nice to be able to, I don't think people have to work full time in the same office these days, but I do think it's nice to have people closer together. Um, but I also think this one meeting has stood us in really good stead. Um, I took T-shirts over. So when we, we all had company T-shirts, when we all went to dinner in Nice, we had our company uniform on. And people were just staring at this group of like six of us or whatever, walking down the street. Uh, everyone's stopping us to ask what we're doing. It just showed me, wow, it's powerful when you wear the same clothes. Sure. <laughs> Everybody's paying attention to this. Sure. And I think we just bonded over you know, drinks, shared experience in Nice. Um, and this all happened over a 72-hour period. Sure. Um, and that has now stood us in good stead. So now we can work remotely. We know each other. Yeah. Um, so to me, that was the key thing there. Yeah, so it is, it's obviously great to be able to have people close by, but if you find the talent you're looking for is not in your geography, don't be afraid to step outside and look elsewhere. Right. So from there, the, the second anchor point or the second step that I was able to extract from what you said was as you look outside of your geographical area, you'll be searching online uh, unless you're for whatever reason using the yellow pages still. If even then, you have to get another, <laughs> another city and state's yellow pages. But uh, you're look, when you look online to find your talent, to find your team members, don't ignore or don't write off platforms that you think, oh no, I wouldn't find anyone good on that. In your case, you did look to Upwork to see, is there good talent here? Absolutely. And we've used people from Upwork. You know, they've been part of a journey. Um, 
right now there is one Upwork uh, developer still working with us at the moment. Um, he's been, and uh, yeah, I can see he's not, and you're right, he, when we spoke to him early on, he made it clear he doesn't want to be full time. Um, but he's a really solid guy and that's why we've continued to work with him. Uh, as I look for new skill sets, I go to Upwork. You know, I need some help with marketing. We're doing yeah. some pretty kind of clever stuff there. And sure. I, I need some people who know things like branch IO, a very, as you say, a very specialty piece. Yeah. Um, and Upwork, I think is excellent for finding those resources. Well, and not only do you find your gig workers, but it is, unless I miss her, that is where you found uh, Dimitro in the, in the Ukraine, right? Actually, no, I'm sorry. We didn't, Dimitro was not from Upwork. Okay, well, so um, what platform did he come from? Um, it was a combination of Google and LinkedIn. Oh, you did Google. Yeah, <laughs> okay, Google and, then, and LinkedIn, right? Yeah. So I, I think, so let, let me ask you then, do you remember like what were your search parameters on LinkedIn to find or that, that got you to him? Yeah, the big thing was React Native, right? Got and Because that was, I was really specifically looking for that. Um, I would, you know, I was trying to get somebody that had Google Maps experience, a lot of, you know, heavy mapping experience and React Native. Sure. But I, I ended up not finding that combination. Um, the React Native thing is interesting. You see a lot of developers who put it on their resume, but when you start to talk to them, <laughs> they really, yes, it's not really there. You know, they just put it on the resume and, oh, yeah, I've kind of seen it. <laughs> and then... So my, um, my CTO is a very technical man himself and, uh, you know, he takes a lot of time and we were using, um, I'm not going to remember the name of the platform team. Uh, sorry, there's a, there's a gone blank. There is a platform. It's really quite clever where you can uh, set up various tests for people, uh, like a technical Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know the name, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And we, <laughs> We use that, I think, you know, very successfully. We like to use that um, because my CTO is not going to allow somebody to um, kind of BS their way. Yeah, talk their way in and then not be yeah. able to prove it once they and start. To, exactly. So, yeah. you know, we found, we found that with Dimitro. He was probably the first React Native guy uh, that we talked to that actually really knew and had done some work in React Native. So that would make that would lead me to believe it's not so it's not just don't ignore areas you might overlook and write off like Upwork which you do for your for your gig workers, but then I would say in conjunction with that, know what are your search terms that you're looking for in a person online, yeah. and don't just rely on a good conversation if it's a technical skill set you're looking for. Set up this test to pr so they can prove. They are not just talk. This is like, to me, that's another step in this. I need to do whatever it takes to make sure we are building the right team here. Yeah. And it's, it, Rog, it's just come to me. Test dome is the one we okay. used. And test the dome? I, test dome. Yeah. And okay. the thing I liked about it is you can go through there. And actually when I was choosing my CTO, um, my previous CTO is, I put him on my advisory board. He was helping me and he and I were looking at test dome and, I, he said, give your CTO candidates this test. And I said, and there's two versions, easy and hard. And I said, which one? He goes, oh, hard, come on. So we give him the hard test. And then the test basically says, and it's tricky. My, my old CTO is pretty, it's tricky for people to cheat on these things because it's timed and just the way they structure it. Mm. So we set up this test. It was supposed to be the average take time was supposed to be an hour, 30 minutes. And the average score is 57%. And we gave that to my now CTO as his test coming into the company. Wow. And what, and what, what was his score? 100% in 37 minutes. <laughs> and it's typically 57%? Uh, Over an, an hour and a half. Wow. That's how you know, know. you've got someone good. Um, from there, I think I saw the next step being once you have the team assembled, whether it's people who are close by or spread out, be willing to address early on, address and to identify and address early on what are the failure points that are happening in our processes and really get a clear idea of what our results supposed to look like. And not kind of as you, saw, as you said before, 
it's okay, but it's not as good as it should be or could be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's where we were. And I think, you know, the communication was a, a challenge. Uh, we, tra- we were using Trello. We still use Trello. Um, it's one of the, you know, the boards where you can put things out right. there and um, assign priorities and uh, yeah, project management for development, essentially. Um, but it wasn't, it's not enough. In my mind, it's not enough. You've got to know the people you're working with. So you can, you, you know, you can, sometimes when things are written down, people can uh, get upset and you know, get their feelings hurt. And it's just, it, it's, it's all um, wasted time and energy. So it's much better if you can understand somebody. And then again, I mean, this is back to what our app is all about. It's all about meeting people. Yeah. Yeah. From there, the sort of the final step that I was able to map out from what you explained is when you are operating and if things aren't going as good as you deem they could be going, be able to assess, is it a product? Is it, do I have the wrong talent or is it a product of environment? What you were able to see was that it was product of environment. Now, can you talk us through, um, how you saw that it really was that and not a lack of skill thing? Well, we did bounce in a few people, you know, we did bounce in and out some people early on in terms of some of the Upwork guys uh, that we tried to patch in. They didn't, did not work with the team. Um, I think my, and this is a bit of a gut instinct. Well, not only gut, I guess I could see kind of what was going on. I, I felt Dimitro was strong. So when Dimitro was having trouble with some of the other developers, I was inclined to believe Dimitro and try to see if, you know, maybe we did need new talent or a different way of working together. And he's been solid throughout the process. Um, So I think, uh, you know, a big part of it is really trying to understand what's going on, the dynamics of what's going on. And then, you know, you, sometimes you get people that just can't work with anybody else. So it, it, is this somebody, brilliant individual, but cannot work with, with anybody else? And I think that was one of the things that was so important to meet these guys in real life, is I wanted to make sure Dimitro really could be part of a, a team and wasn't a, just a brilliant individualist. Um, and sure enough, you know, he was, I was incredibly impressed by him when I met him in person, just impressed by him as a human being, um, the way he works with his team members, um, the way he carries himself. The, you know, one of the first things he did, Raj, when we were sitting there in this hotel in Nice, um, having breakfast together, he says, Joe, we don't have to do this. It costs a lot of money, Joe. This, this is, you know, in your cost, this is like a month. To get here cost like a month's salary in the Ukraine, right? And he was so worried about the cost hmm. um, that I was like, I, you know, I, I love that you care about that. Yeah. And, you know, I said to him, we're not going to do this every month. I said, I felt this was important before we embark on the big push to de- sure. deliver the app that we all know each other. Um, but I really appreciate you, your concern around the, the cash in the business because, you, you know, he could just be sitting out there going, yeah, they'll just write me checks. Yeah. Or, right. Hey, yeah. this is a lot of fun. We're going to get yeah. a, vaca- a mini vacation, right? right. <laughs> so yeah, that is good. Right. What, what, what are people verbalizing on your team that are the things that they care about related to the company? That's yeah. how, you know, someone's kind of all in or not. So Joe, um, uh, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know, uh, where they can find pod and perhaps even learn more about you? Yeah, sure. I mean, pod is available on uh, pod. Well, our website is pod.io. It's available in both uh, app stores, iOS and Android. Um, if you just put in pod, it's not indexing too well yet. They, I think we're so new. Uh, Google and Apple don't really know how to send you to it right now. So, but if you put in pod network, it's coming up. Okay. Uh, so we are having some issues that the links, the direct links are also on the website, www.pod.io. Great. Now, our final two questions to wrap up. Um, we'll each give our sort of our big takeaway lesson for this topic. Uh, so our topic today was uh, around doing whatever it takes to find the right team members. To me, uh, I think probably the biggest thing I pulled out of your story 
was really um, taking your time and due diligence up front to make sure you have you really have someone you can trust or people you can trust um, as well as people who are good at what they do, not just people who are excited about the idea like you are, and then you just gravitate towards that, but they may not have the skill set to back up the excitement. All right. Joe, what would be your one big takeaway or lesson for the audience that you can leave them with? Well, I think, you know, when you're um, running a business, it's absolutely all about the talent and it never stops being about the people. So in the beginning, it's really just, you, you know, a lot of times in the beginning, it's just you trying to figure out the talent. Um, but that never goes away, even as you get bigger, you know, and I think if you talk to um, Sheryl Sandberg, you know, running these large organizations, even at that scale, it's still all about the talent. And I think, you know, to be successful, particularly technology companies need to really focus in on the talent that they currently have, how well it works and bringing in people when they bring in people, making sure uh, that those people are additive and can work well with the team that they have. Our final question, fill in the blank. Entrepreneurship is blank. Oh my goodness. <laughs> is that it's your answer? Everything. Entrepreneurship is oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's everything. It's everything, isn't it? You know, when I think of entrepreneurship, I'll give you a mental image I have. When I was 10 years old, I made gunpowder with my friends. And after about four... <laughs> Four unsuccessful attempts, we finally got the thing to, to explode. But rather than a, a rocket didn't lift up, it literally exploded. <laughs> and I, I think when I think of entrepreneurship, I think of that mental image I saw when we were, just couldn't believe that our rocket just exploded into little bits. And the thing about entrepreneurship is it, it's everything. It's waking up every day wondering, is this crazy? Is this going to work? Um, it's getting all of the bits together to try and make it work. It's being willing to change and pivot and take ideas from new people to make, make your ideas and the original plans work or being able to change altogether. So to me, I mean, entre entrepreneurship really is, it's a little piece of everything. Yeah, it, it, it is <laughs> going in with a guarantee that the rocket's going to explode at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Joe, for joining us. This has been a fabulous conversation. I'm really, I really, I'm appreciative you shared this story and I'm excited to see the growth of Pod. I have downloaded it while we've been talking. Um, so I'm excited to use Pod myself uh, and see this, you know, ideally become one of the next big things to hit the market. Well, thank you very much, Raj. And don't go anywhere, listeners, because coming up next is our brand new segment, Startup Open Mic. So stick around. We're back here on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a brand new segment we are adding to the show and I hope we get it. I hope it becomes a weekly thing. Uh, it'll, be, it'll really just be based on uh, the submissions that we have. But uh, Startup Open Mic is the segment. What we're doing with this is you, the listener, you, the entrepreneur, you, the whoever, can actually submit to me a 60 second or less recording of your elevator pitch and then I'm going to give you feedback on that pitch right here on air. So to kick off Startup Open Mic, we are going to hear from Rebecca Clore, the co-founder of a new app that's currently in beta mode called Roadie. What is Roadie? Well, we're about to find out. But before we do, a little bit of background here. Rebecca and I actually had the chance to meet in person when she attended my workshop at 1871 the big tech incubator here in Chicago. And she's part of the new programming track they have at 1871 um, for build or, or um, you know, MVP prototype stage companies. Uh, and so I came in and did my workshop, how to not suck at pitching your startup, specifically going over like, hey, here's how to craft a really good elevator pitch. So Rebecca was able to take that and within, I'm not kidding, within like 24 hours, Sent me, uh, sent me her pitch for Startup Open Mic. And what she's doing in this is following the formula that I advise and that I give to people in that presentation for an elevator pitch, which is que pasa, uh, which means what's up in Spanish. Um, that's the easy way to remember it, que pasa. 
but PASA is an acronym, P-A-S-A, Problem, Approach, Solution, Action. So let's listen in now to Rebecca's pitch for Rody right here on Startup Open Mic on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. As the token planner of my friend groups, there is nothing more frustrating than people not knowing when or where to show up for a birthday dinner or boozy brunch or downright forgetting you had plans to see a concert because you bought tickets months ago. Worse, you've exchanged emails, posted on Facebook, added details to your story, and sent a million texts. Rody lets everyone get excited in anticipation for the event, not dread or forget it. Our mobile calendar app centralizes the details of your get-togethers in one place. You never have to feel like a tracking and logistics company ever again. We're currently in beta on test flight and need you to help shape Rody's future. So go to rodysocial.com today and add your email so you can get early access. See you on Rody. Okay, thank you, Rebecca, for your pitch there. Um, you know, I, it's a pitch I really like. As you were talking, I could feel the energy and the enthusiasm come out of your voice. Uh, you were very much focused on the user's perspective and not your own. So kudos to you for listening to what I said in the workshop. But um, overall, I think it's really good. I, I liked that you you built up the problem up front by giving specific examples of what this is like in action, right? Uh, missing the boozy brunch. Uh, and then all the details are flying around and you still don't, um, you know, people still don't come together for it at the end of the day. I think, I think all of us have had that happen to us at one point or another. Um, what I'd like to see is on the solution side of it, when you talk about what Rody actually is, my sort of gut reaction or my gut thought when you said, hey, it's like a central calendar app, uh, pretty much, is, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but something like that was, oh, but like, why don't I just use Google Calendar? Because at this point, a lot of other things are integrating with that. And like, if you like, for example, I just booked a dinner reservation earlier this week at the ramen place in Chicago, Ramen San. And when I did that through, I think it was Open Table, it automatically created a calendar event in my Google Calendar. So I want to hear something, not that you have to say directly, this is not like Google Calendar, but I do want to hear what what's the value add on top of the existing options? Um, why am I choosing to use Rody instead of what's already there? And then the last point of feedback I'll give is the, I, I get the sentiment behind the loading and logistics, like, so you don't have to feel like a loading and logistics company, I believe is what you said. I get the sentiment behind that. However, it kind of just like comes out of left field and I don't think it fits. And especially your, your target audience to, that you're speaking to with this, who is like the planner, I don't know if they're thinking of themselves as a logistics company, right? Like when they think about how, how overwhelming it is to have to plan all this stuff, I don't think they're ever saying to themselves, I feel like a logistics company. So I would find a better comparison there towards the end of the solution Perhaps something like, so you don't have to feel like a, a receptionist or like an executive assistant, maybe something like that. Um, or so you don't have to feel like your friend's assistant. That could go a long way. Um, but just something that's a better comparison than the loading and logistics, I think would really help drive the point home uh, towards the end of your pitch. Other than that, again, you followed the KPASA formula, problem, approach, solution, action. You embrace that philosophy that I put out there of think and talk and act like an entertainer and less like an entrepreneur. So I love that. I love that. I could hear that in your voice. And you know, you sent a video link uh, for me to download, so I could actually see, I could I could see you it as well, see you giving it as well, and I could see it in your facial expressions and your body language that you really felt it and believed in what you were saying. So kudos to you for that. Thank you, Rebecca Clore with Rody for joining our inaugural edition of Startup Open Mic right here on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. And that's all we've got for today's show. Thank you, Rebecca Clore with Rody for submitting your elevator pitch for live feedback in our brand new segment on Startup Hype Man, the podcast, Startup Open Mic. And I hope to be doing plenty more of these down the road. If you want your pitch to get feedback by me, all you have to do is submit a audio clip that I can download to media at startuphypeman.com. Here are the rules. In your email, 
you have to also tell me what's your name and what's your company name. Like, in, like write that in the email. You must make it maximum 60 seconds. So a 60 second or less audio clip. It has to be something that we can download on our end. So don't send us a YouTube link. Send us either a voice memo, uh, like record a voice memo on your phone and upload that and send it to us or some other way, record an audio file and put it in, in a Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever. But give us some link that we can download to get your audio, which we will put in this episode or in an episode to get live feedback on. It's Startup Open Mic. I want to be doing plenty more of these. I want to be helping you guys out there. I want to be supporting you uh, more than I already am. And, and I think this could be something really fun if we keep doing this over and over. So again, shout out to Rebecca Clore for being the test guinea pig out of the gate. Did great. And, and uh, let me say this too. If you're worried, oh, I'm going to submit a pitch that's not good. That's the point, right? The point is to get feedback. I'm not, I'm not putting you on blast on these things. I'm trying to, I'm listening to what you have to say, and I am giving you an opportunity to get free feedback from me who has built hundreds of elevator pitches over the years. So Startup Open Mic is our new fresh thing we're adding to Startup Hype Man, the podcast. I really like it. I hope you like it too. And I would love to hear your pitch. Submit an email to media at startuphypeman.com with your 60 second or less elevator pitch. Thank you. And let's close out the show. That concludes this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked what you heard, you can share this episode with a friend or you can leave a rating and review on the Apple podcast page. When you do that, it boosts us in the search results. And ultimately, that means more entrepreneurs will listen, which means we share the message, we spread the mission and support more entrepreneurs at the end of the day. You don't have to stop with the podcast if you want more. And if you are interested in telling your company's story better across your demo calls to investors and to any audience you seek, well, then why not have a conversation with me? Head to startuphypeman.com, fill out a form there, and let's talk. If you've got recommendations for future guests for the show or you want to be a guest on the show yourself, email media at startuphypeman.com. That'll tie a bow on this one. Thank you again to this week's guest for joining. I am Raj Nation. You have been listening to Startup Hype Man, the podcast. We will see you next time. Hype Man out. Word up. Raise up. Got you howling at the moon. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Instead of sundown, too. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Tell me what you're gonna do. This is dance with the devil, girl. And if you can't get it loose, then you fall into the truth. It got you howling at the moon. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Instead of sundown, this a dance with the devil, girl. Tell me what you gonna do. No. This a dance with the devil, girl. And if you can't get a loose, then it's, it's a dance with the devil.